Praise the Lord, church. I can't hear you. Praise the Lord. Today, I stand here before you to, on behalf of the, of the whole quest, to preach to you the word of God. My name is Joshua Mailu, and I am nine years old. I am a firstborn, and I have a brother and my sister. My father is Pastor Jeff, our missions pastor, and my mother is Faith Mailu, who is a Sunday school teacher. I am born again, and I love Jesus as my Christ and Savior, as my Lord and Savior. I stand here by the grace of God to, to preach the word of God to you. And as God told Joshua in the book of Joshua, chapter 1, verse 9, and it says, Be strong and of good courage. Do not be frightened, for the Lord your God is with you. And I know here that the Lord is here with me and will go with me where I and will follow me where I am. Now I would like to invite... I would like to invite um, Brian to read the book of Exodus chapter 33 for us. God is good. And all the time. Yes, as my co pastor. Uh, uh, has said we are going to dive deep in the book of Exodus chapter 33. Yes. And see where the theme of the camp came from. Exodus chapter 33. The Lord said to Moses, Depart, go up from here, you and the people who you have brought up out of the land of Egypt to the land of which I saw to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying, to your offsprings I give it. I will send an angel before you, and I will drive out the Canaanites, the Amorites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and Jebusites. Go up to a land flowing with milk and honey, but I will not go up among you, lest I consume you on the way, for you are a stiff-necked people. When the people heard the dis disastrous word, they mourned, and no one put on his own on, ornament. On For the Lord had said to Moses, Say to the people of Israel, You are, you are stiff necked people. If for a single moment I should go up among you, I would consume you. So now, take off your ornaments that I may know what to, do, what to do with you. Therefore, the people of Israel stripped themselves of their ornaments from Mount Herob or not. No, no Moses used to take the tent and pitch it outside the camp, far out from the camp, and he called it the tent of meeting. And everyone who sought the Lord would go out to the tent of the meeting, which was outside the camp. Whenever Moses went out to the tent, all the people would rise up and each would stand at his tent, tent door and watch Moses until he had gone into the tent. When Moses entered the tent, the pillar of, of cloud would descend and stand at the entrance of the t tent, and the Lord would speak with Moses. And when all the people saw the pillar of, of cloud standing at the entrance of the tent, all people would rise up and worship, each at his tent door. Thus, the Lord used to speak to Moses face to face, as man speaks to his friend. When Moses turned again into the camp, his assistant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man would not depart from the tent. Know, know whom you will send with me, yet you have said, I know you by name, and you also found favor in my sight. Now, therefore, I have, if I have found favor in your sight, please show me now your ways that I may know you in order to find favor in your sight. Consider, too, that this nation is your people, and he said, my presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. And he said to him, if your presence will not go with me, do not bring us, us up from here, for how shall it be known that I have found favor in your sight? 
I and your people, is it not in your going with me so that we are distinct? I and your people from every other people on the face of the earth. And the Lord said to Moses, this very thing that you have spoken, I will do. For you have found favor in my sight, and I know you by name. Moses said, please show me your glory. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before you and will proclaim before you by my name. The Lord and I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious. And I will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. But he said, you cannot see my face. For man shall not see my face. My, my face and live. And the Lord said, Behold, the, there is a place by me where you shall stand on, on the rock. And while my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft of the rock and I will cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will take away my hand and, I sh and you shall see my work, but my face shall not be seen. And that's the word of the Lord. Appreciate him in an even better way. So now we see in the book of Exodus chapter 33, as has been read by Brian. God was angry with the children of Israel as they had turned away from him and forsaken him, yet he brought them out from Egypt where they were slaves, and they still decided to forsake him. God orders Moses and the Israelites to leave Mount Sinai. He says he will not go with them, but he will send his angel to go with them. When the people heard what God said, they mourned, they mourned and removed all their jewelry. Moses then set up a tent outside of the camp where the Israelites would seek their Lord. So what happened is that every time Moses would enter the tent, the pillar of cloud would descend and stand at, at the door of the tent. And all the Israelites would worship from where they were. And God would speak with Moses face to face as someone would speak to his friend. Can you just imagine if God came to you and you are speaking with him face to face? Would you like to enjoy that experience? I hope you would, because I would also enjoy. Then there was this young man called Joshua, who never left the tent. Because of Moses' prayers, God heard him and said that he will go with them and give them victory. Moses insisted and told God to confirm that he will go with them. Then, then, because Moses knew if God didn't go with them, they would be defeated by, their, by all their enemies. So Moses, with a humble heart, tells God, show me your glory. Just like Moses, we need to have a desire for God to be with, for God to be with us and for him to show himself. Moses had seen the victory of God and was confident that only God could help him. Sometimes life can be tough, but we need to desire, desire God's presence as it will be enough for us. If you feel stressed, you should seek God. If you feel like you're, you've been defeated by your enemies, you should seek God. In everything you do, you should seek God. The more we seek God, the more we experience his glory. Thank you. Now I would like to invite Jeffrey, our crossroad teacher, to come and conclude it. Thank you so much, uh, Pastor Joshua. Uh, it's amazing. Can we appreciate him more? Uh, he has done amazing. Uh, that is excellent. That's excellent. Yes, Buenesa Sifiwe. Yeah, as he has said, uh, my name is uh, Jeffrey. Mother, I help uh, lead the teens ministry, or rather, I 
help the discussions. As our service uh, leader was telling us, we discuss God's word. So my work is to help us to yeah, think more about God's work. Uh, I, I'm also a uh, children's worker. So before I came here, I was serving in the children's ministry. And it's a joy to see that uh, God allows his children uh, to, I mean, to serve him. And it's possible for them uh, to know God. So uh, I want us to, to talk about three things. And our sermon, as you can see on your screen, is that we're talking about a God merciful and gracious. A God merciful and gracious. I'm going to point us to three things that teach us to see uh, how God is merciful and gracious to a people who do not deserve to see his grace and mercy, especially to the prayer that Moses made that show me your glory, but God responds by showing him his glory. When you look at verse, verse 18, Moses says that, please show me your glory. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before you and I will proclaim before you my name, the Lord. So Moses makes this prayer to God or this request to God that please show me your glory. And God responds by saying, you know what? I'm going to do what you are asking, but in my way. And the way that I'm going to show you is that I'm going to proclaim my name to you. I'm going to let my goodness pass before you and proclaim uh, my name to you. And when you look at chapter 34, uh, verse 6, we get to see what happens. That uh, We're told that the Bible says that the Lord passed before him and proclaimed, the Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. So we get to see that Moses gets to experience the glory of God in the way God intends him to, uh, to know, that he wants him to get to know who God is. God declares his name before Moses, and he shows his goodness. And in a, in a greater way is to help us to see that God is a God who is merciful and God who is gracious. He declares, and that's what we, you and me, need to know, that God is merciful and gracious. But how does that happen? How does it pan out for these children of Israel who are, in a greater way, uh, people like you and me? When you look at chapter 32, we get to see what happens is that the children of Israel make this great sin before God. They choose to worship idols. They make an idol and worship. Um, and Moses, while he's up in the mountain, God tells him that, you know what? These people, they, they are sinful, and I'm going to deal with them. So what happens? Then Moses goes down, carrying the Ten Commandments, and he finds these people worshiping uh, this idol, and he breaks the Ten Commandments, and he, he, he's so distraught because of this great sin that he has made, uh, that these people have made. And the first point I want us to see is that sin is bad, and it is separates us from God. Sin is bad, and it is separates us from God. What is sin? Sin is rejecting or ignoring God in the world that he has made, but not doing, but not being or doing what he has told us to do in his law. We act in rebellion by living without reference to him, but not being or doing what he requires in his law. And this results in death and disintegration of all creation. So the children of Israel have sinned a great sin against God, and this has caused a separation between them and God. Sin is so bad that it causes God uh, to depart from his people. And God says that to Moses that these people are rebellious. These people are so stubborn. These people are stiff-necked people. They rebel against what I, I've, I've taught them to do. But how does God react towards sin? How does God feel about our rebellion? How does God feel about our disobedience to him? To the children of Israel, or in this instant, he told Moses, you know what? 
I'm going to withdraw away from these people. You know what? I'm going to let you go into the land that I promised you. I'm going to let an angel go and fight your battles. But my presence is not going to be with you. And that's a big problem. That's a big problem because as you can look at how the people of Israel responded to this news in verse 4, we are being told that when the people heard this disastrous word, they mourned and no one put on his ornaments. Why, why, what is a big problem? Because these children of Israel were on the way to the promised land. And God is saying, even though you've done this great sin, I'm going to let you go. Then secondly, God is not withdrawing his security in terms of an angel to go and fight for these people. So in a sense, they will enjoy that God is fighting for their battles. But this statement that God's presence is going to be, or rather it's not going to go amongst them, seems to be such a great problem. And you can see why it's such a big problem. Because when you look at verse uh, from verse 13, Moses said that, Now, therefore, I have ever found favor in your sight. Please show me now your ways that I may know you in order, that, uh, in order to find favor in your sight. Consider this too. This nation is your people. And then, w- when you look at verse 16, he said that, For how shall it be known that I have found favor in your sight, I and your people? Is it not in your going with us so that we are distinct and I and your people from every other people of the nation. That we get to see this was a big problem because the most scariest thing for the children of Israel was God withdrawing from their presence. Canaan would not be pleasant and fulfilling land if God was not going to be with them. If his presence was not going to be with them, Canaan was not going to be fulfilling. Without God... Nothing means anything. Nothing makes sense. Nothing is fulfilling if God is not in it. The only way to know what you have found, that you have found real favor, is when God goes with us. God is the only factor that makes you and me different. It's not the blessings that we have. It's not the money that we have. Because these children of Israel knew that even though God allows us to experience all the promises that he made to us, if his presence is not going to be with us, it's not going to make sense. And that is the bad news, to see that sin separates us from God. Brothers and sisters, our identity, our joy, our value, and fulfillment are in God, or they are to be in God. If that is taken away from us, then we have nothing. I don't know, some of us could be taking pride in big jobs, in money, in cars, in good families. I don't know, whatever it is, what gives us identity other than God. Because you get to see the children of Israel knew what makes us different. Is God's presence in our lives. It's not because I have other things that people don't have. What makes you different and distinct is the presence of God in your life. God did not take away the blessing or the promise of land and protection for these people. But this would mean they have the blessing, but not the God of the blessing. And sometimes we are so much looking to be blessed by God without the God of the blessing. And that's a big problem because it means nothing that if you can have the entire world, but God is not in it. We need to be reminded that sin separates us from God. Sin made God separate himself from the children of Israel. But then we get to see something interesting happening that how does God respond to these people? He tells Moses, you know what? Uh, Tell these people to take away their ornaments and everything so that I may know how to deal with them. One, we get to see that God is merciful and gracious because when you talk about mercy, we talk about God 
not giving us what we deserve. That if someone does something bad, they deserve to be punished. But God does not do that to the children of Israel. He does not punish the children of Israel by the sin that they have made. And God is gracious because he gives us what actually we don't deserve to be given. And we get to see glimpses of mercy and grace about the way God responds to these children of Israel. One, that he says that I'm going to allow you to go into the land that I promised you. Secondly, I'm going to send an angel to fight for your battles. But then thirdly, it gives them an opportunity to repent of their sins. It tells them, take away your ornaments. And in, in essence, he's allowing them and he's saying that if you do that, I'm going to know what to do with you. I'm going to deal with you according to that. If anyone responds in, uh, in mourning and in repentance, then they would experience the mercy of God. But in a greater sense, we get to see Moses setting up a, a tent outside the camp that whoever wants to meet with God, then they have an opportunity to go there and meet with God. You get to see that the tent was outside the camp, which made one thing, that whoever wanted to meet God and to be intentional about God, be able to make an effort to go and get close to God. Whoever wanted to be, to seek the Lord and to separate from the camp, because what? When God deals with you, or God deals with us, there's always a separation. God cannot deal with you when you are in the rest of the camp where whatever is causing us to be separated from him is still in our presence. We need to make that deliberate effort to go outside the camp and seek God. Moses wanted to know God, but he bases all this by the grace of God. He actually goes to God and says that if I have found favor in your presence or in your sight, he knows that the only way God allows him in his presence is if he has found favor. But there's something interesting that Moses prays. When you look at verse, uh, verse 13, he says that, now, therefore, if I found favor in your sight, please show me now your ways that I may know you in order to find, uh, in order to find favor in your sight. He's saying, God, if I found favor in your sight or grace in your sight, please teach me your ways so that I may continue experiencing your favor. God's favor causes us to want to know him more. God's presence, or when, like Joshua mentioned, that the more we seek God, the more we want to know him. And when we experience the favor of God, he causes, or it causes us to want to know more of him. And the more we know God, the more we long to know him. And then we submit to him that he may teach us his ways. Moses comes to God and tells him, please teach me your ways so that I may continue to experience your favor. And the more we draw to God, the more we submit to his word that he may teach us and we may continue to experience his favor. God is gracious. He doesn't deal with us what we deserve, but he actually extends his mercy to us. God takes away the punishment that we deserve. Actually, to the children of Israel, they deserve to be punished, but God withdrew that, or withheld all that, and actually, that's the same thing that he does to us, to you and to me, that though we are sinful people, God does not deal with us the way we deserve, but he extends his mercy to us. And actually, he extends that mercy by sending Jesus Christ, who takes away our sin for us. That sin separates us from God. But we get to see that actually, by God's grace and mercy, he has made a way that you and me don't get what we deserve. Praise the Lord. The second point I want to, uh, to mention that sinners can be reconciled with God. All sinners can be made right with God. And how does this happen? Someone may ask. When you 
uh, as I mentioned, Exodus chapter 32 talks about the great sin the children of Israel did. But we get to see, actually, if you uh, look at when Moses went down from the mountain, he comes and finds these people are doing this great sin. And uh, in, in verse 30, he said that the next day of chapter 32, Moses said to the people, you have seen a great sin, and now I will go to the Lord. Perhaps I can make an atonement for your sin. But here are sinners, and we are wondering, how can these sinners be reconciled back to God? And Moses said that, you know what? I'm going to go up to God and perhaps try to make an atonement for your sins. And sinners, you and me, can be reconciled to God if there's someone who is interceding for us. If there's someone who is pleading your case and my case before God. For the, for the children of Israel, Moses was this intercessor who stood before God and the children of Israel and he interceded or he made an atonement for the forgiveness of the sins of the children of Israel. And it's amazing to know that, you know what? Sinners cannot approach God unless there's someone who intercedes for their sake, for their behalf. And for children of Israel, we are so lucky that Moses was there to intercede for them, was there to talk on their, on their behalf before God. The identity of the children of Israel is tied to the fact that God is among them. And if this is taken away, then the identity is lost. But how is it restored? We see that Moses makes this bold intercession before God for his, uh, for his people. And the Lord granted his prayer and he answered it. God promised to show his goodness and his glory lies in his goodness. And we want, if you want to experience God, we need to pray to experience his goodness. Because, you know what, uh, because of intercession of Moses, then, uh, or rather, if we are someone interceding for us and we get to experience the goodness of God, then we see that God is able to heal the heart that we experience. He's able to calm the storms that we experience. He's able to restore those who are broken. In his goodness, the Lord is gracious and merciful. Actually, uh, when he's declaring his name, he says that he is slow to anger and bounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. And if we are someone who is interceding for us, then we get to experience the slowness and the exceeding abundant grace uh, and faithfulness of God. We need to know that God does not overlook sin. He visits it. But for the children of Israel, and for us, we get to see if there's someone, an intercessor who is standing for us, then there's a way God makes us right. Just like Moses' uh, people interceded for the children of Israel, then we see that Jesus intercedes on your behalf before God. That Moses is this man who stands and intercedes for the children of Israel. But for you and me, we get to see the man Jesus is the one who stands before you and God and pleading mercy for you. That you, though sinful, me, though sinful, we can get to be made right with God. Moses is making this deep prayer that God, please, know that these are your people. And Jesus is praying for you before God. He's interceding for you that you can have an opportunity to have a fellowship with God. When you look at Hebrews chapter 3, 4, and 5, it, talk, it talks about how Jesus is greater than Moses. Is this greater intercessor who actually prays for us? And it's a joy to know that you and me today, we can be made right with God. It doesn't matter how much sin or how far we strayed away from God. But it's great to know that sinners, people who do not deserve God, can be shown mercy only because there's someone who intercedes for them. We can experience the mercy of God through the man, Jesus, who is interceding for you and for me. And even when you look at Jesus, his intercession is so greater that he died for you and for me. 
He made that sacrifice that all what you did, all your sin, all your failings, he can claim it before God and say, you know what? I have died for this man. I have died for this woman. And therefore, even his intercession makes more sense before God. The third point and the last one I want us to look at is that you and me can experience God intimately or closely. You and me can experience God intimately or closely. The Lord declared his name and character that he is a God. Uh, let me read that again, chapter 34, verse 6 uh, and 7. It talks about uh, the Lord, the Lord, God, merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. And such is a great deal for us to know why does the Lord wants us to know his character. Why does he want us to know his name? It's such a big deal for us to know who God is. He makes himself known to us. That you and me can know God and can relate with him. He self-declares himself before Moses so that Moses can get to know him. And God is able, we are able to know God, and therefore because we know him, we can have that relationship with you, with him. Maybe you can think Moses was so special that he was able to have this experience, God, and we're thinking, if Moses is praying, please show me your glory. Moses must be that special. Or oh, this is for pastors to know and to experience the glory of God because probably you think they walk closely with God. But I submit to us that God has made it possible that you and me can get to know him closely. That when we make the prayer, that we want to know him, we want to experience your glory, God makes it possible because he has declared himself to us. He has made himself known to us so that we can relate with him. God gives Moses what he needs to know. You know, Moses said, show me your glory, but God gives him what he needs to know. And what Moses needs to know is who God is and his character. And by that, Moses, we say that God to experience the glory of God. And how do you and me get to experience that glory of God? By knowing who God is and by experiencing his character, that he is a God who is gracious and merciful. He's a God who is ready to forgive, who is gracious and merciful, who is slow to anchor. God who does not forsake his people. But then, the final thing I want, us to, I want to point us to is to look at verse 21 and 22. As I welcome the worship team to come and lead us in the last song that we're going to pray, to sing as we pray. Look at verse 21. God said that, and the Lord said, Behold, there's a place by me where you shall stand on the rock. Moses is saying, please show me your glory. And how does God respond? He tells him, you know what? You're going to experience my glory, but there's a place by me where you, need, you will have to stand on a rock. On a rock that is firm because you and me, because of our sinfulness, Moses being human, we cannot look at God and live. And how does God make it possible that you and me can experience his glory? He gives us a rock by which we can stand firm so that we can experience him. And something else he does is that he says that, and while my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft of the rock and I will cover you with my hand until I have passed. God protects Moses when he passes by. God protects Moses so that he is not consumed by his glory, but he gives him a safety, a firm foundation upon which he has to stand so that he can experience the glory of God. And if for you and me today were to experience the glory of God, then we cannot do that when we are standing on shaky grounds. We can only experience the glory of God when we are standing on the firm foundation, the rock that God has given us. It's interesting to see that God is the one who provides this rock, the rock of ages. 
the rock that Jesus is. The Lord has provided a rock upon which we are to stand. This rock is firm and secure. And what are we supposed to do? We are to cleave onto this rock. You know, when Jesus died on the cross, what he did is that God's glory is shining upon people. And if anyone is sinful, then his glory will consume them. But then God puts a cross so that we on this other side of the cross of God, we can be able to experience the mercy and the grace of God. We can get to experience God personally, intimately. Just like God put Moses in, a cleft, in the cleft of the rock so that there, him standing on the rock, firm and secure, he gets to experience the glory of God. Three things. One, sin is bad and separates us from God. But God is merciful and gracious that he doesn't deal with you like we deserve. Secondly, that God makes it possible that you and me can have a chance that we can go back to him by giving us a mediator, someone who can plead your case before him. And thirdly, that we have an opportunity to experience the glory of God. Because of what? God has provided a rock upon which we stand and a cleave, cleft where we can hold on and experience the glory. Because outside, anywhere else, God will not allow us to experience his glory. And I want us to stand to sing this song, Rock of Ages, Cleft for Me. ask God that he may help us. He may help you. I don't know what is the condition of your heart. Probably some feeling overwhelmed by the weight of sin. You wonder where do I begin? It's a great opportunity to know that God is gracious and merciful gracious and willing to show his glory to someone like you. He's willing. He's willing. He's willing for you to experience his grace and mercy. Please. Rock of ages cleft from me let me hide myself in thee. Let the waters and the blood from the wounded side with Lord be your sin that troubled you. Save me from. Ah. Uh -huh.